my wonderful friends. <clears throat> Here we are starting off Monday morning, bright and early, end of February. It's a fast month. So, hello, Trisha. You're the first one on today. It's so good to see you. I'm happy that you're here. We always love seeing where everyone's from, and I hope that you all had a fantastic weekend. I know I did. It's been nice weather here in Utah. So, thank you, everyone, for joining us already. It's so great to see you. How's the weather around the world? That's the question. And as, as we look at the weather around the world, how, how was the weekend for everyone? I'd love to have you give us insights onto how you're doing. I love just reading this as we go along. I'm looking for Elaine. I'm trying to make sure we, we think that she always tries to get on, but we're not seeing it as fast as we would like to. So we're just trying to pay attention. But hello, everyone. North Carolina. How's the weather in North Carolina? Elaine, I just waved at you. It says you joined. So now I just need a request to have you enter. Hi, Celeste. That's my sister. And Charmaine, it's so good to see you too. Hello, friends. Syracuse, Utah. And T Mom. We'll keep going here. Good morning, everyone. Mary from Provo. It's so great to have you. It is nice to have Utah shining right now, for sure. All right. We'll keep going. Oh, Colorado is windy and beautiful. Auburn, Washington. Nice. I just went off for a second. My phone is, my computer's going off. All right. Florida. Hello, beautiful. Thank you. I'm assuming that's <laughs> Ireland. Wow, this is so fun. Nebraska, we have crazy nice weather, but we need moisture for the farmers. Oh, I, I'm sure that's true. Hello, Sue Cochran from Oregon. So nice to see you too. Calgary, Alberta. Wow, Canada. Virginia is overcast, but starting to feel like spring. Oh, it's so fun to have all of you joining. Missouri is sunny and up to 70, wow, spring in Georgia. This is so fun. Well, as we're waiting for Elaine to get on here, um, I, think we, I think we're gonna get, gonna get started. Oh, Elaine, there you go, view request, accept. Cloudy this morning, let's see if this works with Elaine. Arizona, hello Arizona, it's so good to see you as well. Edmonton, lots of snow. Well, hello, dear Elaine. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> Some people figure it out, Elaine. I don't. I don't know what it is, but it's so great to see you. Hi, friend. Somebody send me instructions if you know if you know what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing wrong, but you sure look great. Good morning, friend. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to do this talk. Oh, I'm, really I'm so excited. Isn't it a great talk? It is a great talk, and this is a given by a great man. I, I tell you, I have known, I was thinking about this, I have known Elder Renland since he was a, an Area 70. In fact, when I was on the Young Women Board, I did my first training with him. Can wow. you believe that? Wow. So that, and I was figuring it out this morning, that's about 25 years ago. That's a long time. That's amazing, Elaine. You have, yeah, you have some good stories to share. <laughs> well, I, I just remember that he gave the most memorable talk I have I've heard, ever heard. And he talked about covenants. And I was, I was just he, he, he t likened, he talked about Lewis and Clark, and the Yankton Sioux tribe, and how they they were just, uh, they made covenants They made agreements, and they wouldn't break them. And I was so taken by that talk that I actually asked him for a copy of it and he gave me the one that he used that night. I still have wow. it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Elaine, you bring up a good point. I was I was thinking today, and we need to put some of these again in the comments. We've got to do this on, on YouTube as well, get those up there. But um, you know, I was just reflecting on the many talks that Elder Renlin has given in the last few years and the ones that have stood out to me and not necessarily saying them all by name, but 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 I just I I mean, in addition to this one, which I think is just a, this is going to be, this is already a classic talk. But one that I love, and I'll refer to this, is it's called Experience God's Love. It's a BYU devotional. He has given some incredible BYU devotionals for those of you who are interested in going to the BYU speeches. Um, he gave, that was the 2019. He gave another one in 2023 on covenants again. And then he gave one in 2021. 
these these are phenomenal talks. And then if we also remember his great talk when he when he talks about um, the closer we come to God, the more dependent we realize we are on him and the more grateful we are for him. And then he gave the great one about about throwing our weapons of war into the into the um, the waterfalls. I mean, he's given so many, he's such a he's such a thinker. And then I, I love his book on the priesthood that he wrote with his wife. I mean, it's just such a fantastic understanding, helping us to understand better the priesthood, priesthood power. So, you know, I, I just, I'm amazing. I'm, I'm just amazed. And I'm also amazed at his wife. I mean, Sarah oh, yeah. Renland, wow. I mean, talk about a powerhouse couple, you know? Oh yeah, and you know, he was a heart, heart surgeon, one of the best. One of the very best. I had him pegged to be mine if I ever had a heart attack. <laughs> and then I was so disappointed. No, not really. But, uh, and then Ruth was a, a, a very prominent lawyer and gave up her practice when he was called. Yeah. But I, I tell you, when they announced his name, I was not surprised. Not one bit. Because he was prophetic back 25 years years ago. He said some things. He walked me to the car that night so I didn't have to go alone. And he said some things that night that looking back were very prophetic to me. Wow. Crazy, yeah. huh? Yeah, absolutely crazy. Yeah. I, I've just listened to him and the way he explains his talks and things. I mean, the one he gave, I can't remember the name of it, but he was, it was talking about jealousy, unrighteous jealousy. And I, I mean, just so many where you just, he has a way of, he's so, his mind goes so deep and he has such an ability to, to comprehend so many things and then just bring it. And I, and I, I, he did this in this talk as well. He just gives you these stories and the analogies and things and he brings it in and he just, and then he just gives you the punchline, you know, just Ooh. boom. And he's just, I mean, he's, you can tell he's a surgeon. He just narrows it right in and then <laughs> cuts, you know, I mean, it's, but it's not like it's, it's a cut to save our lives. It's so good, Elaine. So that's awesome. Really, I was in, it's a great question for our day too, don't you think? I mean, oh. uh, I'm, Christ is the treasure. That's the title of the talk. But are are we missing the mark? I think we have to. You know, as I was walking with him this morning early, yeah, I just thought, you know, if I could choose, if some people choose words for their year. You have, I think, you yep. have. I think if I could choose today, today my word would be focus. Oh, that's just good. focus that late are focused on our Savior Jesus Christ not missing the mark Elaine I I'll give you one more I was in um, you're right on missing the mark I was in Argentina speaking to a number of young adults in Argentina and Ruth Renlin sister Renlin spoke to them as well that that day and she really talked to them speaking of focus she just said you know as a as an attorney I was extremely busy. My husband was a heart surgeon and she started going into her husband's calling. She talked about how she was a mom and they had a daughter at home. And she just said, you know, um, some of the, some of the young adults were asking how to balance. And she just said, there's a reality that you have to figure out what is most important and what is not. And she just said, you know, I, I had to give up certain things that I realized. She said, if other people can do it and I can have them do it in my situation, so that I can focus on what's the most important, and then that's what I do. And she, she just talked about everyone's in a different position, but we have to hone it in and say, what really matters to me as a woman in the church, what really matters to me in this case as a mother, what matters to me working, and she just said, in my case, I took it to the Lord, I received my errand, and I took out everything that wasn't important and either let it go, or I had somebody else work on it. And I know for some of us, we can't just have other people working on everything all the time, but her point was, Focus on what is most important and what you can do the most and let other things go. We, we can't all be, we can't all have everything at once and we have to prioritize and, and try to balance where we can. Every woman is going to be different and what's going to be most important to them at that time in their lives. And that's what she talked about. Figure out what's most important, you and the Lord, and figure out how you're going to handle it. It was such a great talk and such a great understanding for those young adults, especially. Although, I mean, my, my notes are actually write in this little like one of my notebooks if my notes are in this I wasn't gonna pull this out but this is my sister Renlin speaking and I have I have her notes right here it affected me it affected me as I was one of the speakers and just thinking you know I've got to I've got to step up to the plate and learn about your here, here you can see sister Renlin right there that oh was, look how cool that was her you know just helping us understand and then she talks about she talks about the topic was actually learning to budget our time so instead of budgeting our finance, it was budgeting our time. Anyway, really good. And then she talked about the loneliness of leadership. 
So it's just a powerhouse couple, these two. And obviously the Lord has, as I teach my, my Living Prophets class, these, these women are equally yoked to, their, to the men. They're, they're, they're a couple. The Lord, is, the Lord is calling them. Obviously the apostle is being called, but these women are equally yoked with their husbands. And I just appreciate their examples and their, and their hard work. Fascinating. And their spirituality. Anyway, uh, Lane. Ditto, ditto, Barb. Um, I don't know, before we may, maybe just dive deep into this talk, it, when I read this talk the first time, when I heard it, I, it, it wasn't as impactful to my soul, although he always impacts me. Yeah. As it was when I read it the first time, then the second time, and then as I listened to it again this morning twice. Yeah. What a talk absolutely so important for us in this day could not be more important and it just totally again it's so crazy it totally aligns with what we've been reading in the book of mormon clear back to when lehi sees the tree yeah you know stay on that path keep that focus don't you know don't absolutely look look beyond the mark or sideways just stay focused on our treasure jesus christ amen Elaine, the, amen. Should we should we jump into this? Yeah, let's talk. To let's give, do. Giving us some background here, so maybe I'll just do a quick summary, and then we can talk doctrines and principles as we go through here. Is that okay? Let's do. Uh, yes, and and I I hope when we talk, what doctrines and principles stood out to us, everyone puts yours up, so we can keep practicing knowing the difference between a doctrine, principle, and an application. Right. Okay, go ahead, Barb. Elaine, thank you. And I, you know, I've been, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, especially as we've been, you know, as you know, Elaine, we just did this podcast, this more formal podcast together this week. And I've been thinking about, it's so nice and great to tell stories, which, which I love. Elder Renlund tells stories here. But I, I am genuinely concerned that sometimes we, we, in telling our stories, which are great, that we don't forget to focus on the doctrines and principles of the gospel. It, it, it's, it can be easier sometimes to apply what we don't even know may be true, just because we're talking about the topic of hope. But just as a reminder for all of us that when we're talking and giving these stories, it is wise to pay the price to know, as Elder, as Elder Renlund's talking about here, the plainness of the gospel. And I think that sometimes that's looking beyond the mark as well, that we remember that we need to, we, we need to be set and grounded in plainness. And, and these prophets and leaders of the church are teaching us plainly. It's not, it's not confusing. They're, they're guiding us through this. So just as a reminder, as we continue to study, Elaine, the, the purpose of this walk with him is really to help us. One of the reasons, we have many reasons, I guess, one to be grounded and, and gathering together as men and women, but one is to help us to be, to be firmly committed to walking with him and walking with his gospel, not, not, not periphery things, not leaves on the tree, but to be focusing on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anyway. It's been on my mind, and I think this talk helped me get there too. Elaine, thanks for <laughs> thanks for bearing with me here. So our talk is "Jesus Christ is the Treasure" by Elder Renland, and he just tells the story of these two Englishmen, George Herbert Herbert and um, and Howard Carter, and they're talking about trying to dig for dig for this King Tutankhamun, I, which I I probably just destroyed the name, and they just talk about how they were digging and and unsuccessfully trying to uncover this tomb and eventually they decided to go and look in this area which I think is fascinating in an area that is in their basement where they're actually living I guess and it's, it says sorry it probably isn't their basement I have to be careful here number four Carter realized that the entire floor of the Valley of the Kings have been methodically excavated except the area of their own base camp and then within a few days of digging there they found the first steps leading down to the tomb so I, I found this interesting. There's so many footnotes here, Elaine. So many good footnotes. But I just thought it was interesting. He actually explains in the footnotes that that the area of this of this camp was, and he kind of goes into a little bit detail. But this is where a lot of little huts were built, and it was just a, a very poor and lowly area. And so they just didn't think that they would have a tomb with a ton of gold underneath this. So I think it's fascinating that the place they didn't look was this was this very plain, boring poor area which ended up being the area that this this pot of this room of gold was found anyway then we get to number six and he says during those years of ineffectual search carter and Car carnarvon had overlooked what was literally under their feet some five 
centuries before the Savior's birth, the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob referred to taking for granted or undervaluing what is nearby as looking beyond the mark. So now we're getting into this doctrine and principle here. So he's given us the story, and now the doctrines and principles are going to come out. Jacob foresaw that the people of Jerusalem would not recognize the promised Messiah when he came. Jacob prophesied that they would be a people who despised the words of plainness and would seek for things that they could not understand. Wherefore, because of their blindness, which blindness would come by looking beyond the mark, they must needs fall. In other words, they would stumble. And I love that Elder Renlin gives us that definition. They must fall, or in other words, stumble. Okay, Elaine, I've blasted my mouth here. Do you want to do you want to walk us through maybe doctrine principles as you're seeing them? And also, those of you who are on here, we would love to see your doctrines and principles as well. Yeah, yeah, because we, I think we're still getting a few little questions like, well, so is repentance a doctrine or a principle? And so, let's just take a look. But um, okay, for me, uh, there were three three doctrines that he okay. taught. He taught, he taught the atonement of Jesus Christ. He definitely taught the Godhead. And then he goes on later in his talk, I think, to talk about the restoration when he talks about temples and oh, covenants yeah. and so on. And so what I did with my, with my talk is I just, I, start, I wrote the doctrine that I could see and then I dried, drew uh, lines from the, to, from the talk to where I, you know, so I could say, here's where he taught about the plant, you know, yeah. uh, the, the restoration. And so that's, that was very helpful for me um, to do that yesterday. So thank you, Elaine. So I'm going to, I think that's very, very, very helpful. One of the things I know I've done this so many times, but I'm just going to show you, those of you who are watching. So I do a tree. So just like Elaine would say, I would say, and I don't know how to make this. Oh, maybe I can, maybe I can just see. Hold on. I just saw this button. Does that flip it? Oh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> Sorry. That, flips it that is not the right button. Hold on. Let me try that again. <laughs> you guys, I'm so sorry that we don't know what we're doing, that I don't know what I'm doing. Elaine knows what she's doing. That clearly was not the right button. So anyway, I do this tree, and I know it's backwards, but this is the doctor on this part. So then if I were to draw the principles, so in this case, I would say the doctrine of the plan of salvation. And then I would say, sometimes we look beyond the mark. And this looking beyond the mark could be a part of a principle. And the principle could be, as Elaine said, focusing on Christ. So focusing on Christ could be the principle. And then looking beyond the mark is kind of the warning of the principle. And then we say, so here I do, these are my principles, I do branches. And then I can do branches off of branches, right? And so in this talk, we're gonna go through it, but in this talk, he's going to give us branches off of branches or limbs that are going to be associated with this idea of looking beyond the mark. And he's gonna give us different ways that we can look beyond the mark. And he's also going to give us ways that Christ is the treasure and what we can do. And then the leaves on the tree become our personal application, right? So this becomes how we then are going to apply this or how people have applied it in their lives. So as we do this, we look at this doctrine and Elaine, thank you for those three. I think those are fantastic doctrines. We look at those doctrines, we look at the principles that are associated with it and there are a number of them. And then we say, okay, therefore what with me? So Elaine, I'm going to give you, I'm going to, I'm going to give you one, one on mine and then please go for it again. Um, he uses the example of Jacob's people and he says, Jacob's people did look beyond or look past the savior of the world. So now he's giving another story, but he's going to give a, he's, he's proving his point. In other words, he says, instead of recognizing his role in fulfilling heavenly father's plan, they condemned and crucified him. They looked and waited for someone else to bring them salvation. And then he says, like those people in Jerusalem and like Carter and Carnivore, we too, now here, be, here comes the principle. We too can be prone to look beyond the mark. We need to guard against this tendency, lest we miss Jesus Christ in our lives and fail to recognize the many blessings he offers us. We need him. We are counseled to rely wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Now, here we go. Number nine, huge principle, tons of principles in here. He is our mark. This could be doctrine as well, right? The Godhead, Jesus Christ and his atonement. 
If we incorrectly imagine that there is a need for something beyond what he offers, we deny or diminish the scope and power he can have in our lives. He has claimed the rights of mercy and extends that mercy to us. He is the ultimate source to whom we should look for remission of our sins. He is our advocate with the Father and champions what the Father has wanted all along for us to return to him as inheritors in his kingdom. We need, in the words of the prophet Alma, to cast about our eyes and begin to believe in the Son of God, that he will come to redeem his people and that he shall suffer and die to atone for our sins and that he shall rise again from the dead, which shall bring to pass the resurrection. And then he says, Jesus Christ is our treasure. In this number nine, you see both doctrines, you're, you're, you're deepening the doctrine of the atonement of Jesus Christ and the Godhead, as well as he's teaching principles and principles are giving us that framework of what we need to be doing in our lives. So we're getting both doctrine and principles. Doctrine is deepening and helping us understand the savior, his atonement, it could be the Godhead. The principles are helping us understand how to apply. It's not the application, but how, but, but it's the what behind it. So he's teaching us some of these verbs that we could be looking at in our own lives. Okay, that was me blasting my mouth, Elaine. Well, you know what, that, you're, you're brilliant, Barbara, and I, I love to listen to you because I just love, the, I love learning how you think. Well, it's likewise. So, it's just so spot on. And if you go down to that next paragraph, paragraph 10, here we have the, the principle of repentance. Yes, exactly. Which, which then we can tie that principle to, of course, the atonement of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you know, it's interesting because in our reading in the Book of Mormon, as we've been reading the words of Jacob, you know, Jacob 9, the, the, yeah. the amazing sermon. Jacob Amen. 9, I think I'm going to make it a, a point to just try to read that. Uh, not every day because it's long, but I'm going to try to read it a lot yeah. because it is huge. But it all ties back into Jacob 9. And then you go on in our reading of the Book of Mormon. And in chapter 11 of, of Second Nephi, wow. It starts out with just this huge thing. Jacob saw our Savior. I mean, he's not going to look beyond the mark. He's, he's going to, he knows. And, and I just, I love that. I love the fact that, um, that the Lord gives us two or three, usually three witnesses. And, and in this case, uh, he saw his Redeemer. He says right down in the bottom of uh, verse 2, chapter 11, he verily saw my Redeemer. Uh, so he, he saw his Redeemer, Nephi saw Christ, and Isaiah, whom he's going to quote also. All of them have a per per personal witness. Um, so you can rely on these, these prophets to hit the mark. <laughs> They're not going to look beyond. They're not. not and, and Elaine, that we're, we're going to, I mean, really, at the end of this talk, he gives us those prophets as one of these ways to make sure we are not looking beyond the mark. The, the prophets aren't going to look beyond the mark. The, the Lord, the Lord has, has taught them and raised them and they're going to continue to guide us. I, I, I cannot say this, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna save it maybe because I have to think through this, I can't say this strongly enough. If we think that there's somebody else that we can look to on this world that is going to keep us safe beyond the prophets, we're kidding ourselves. Can we look to our parents and other people? Yes, but if there's somebody who's taking the place of the prophets, if we're reading some some really intellectual person, and I, I mean, being a BYU professor myself, I'm, I'm very conscientious of this. If we're thinking somebody's smarter than the prophet or the prophet is wrong, or that maybe another prophet after somebody else dies is going to change things up, we have to be so careful. It's called looking beyond the mark. I I. I I feel so strongly about that that I get emotional when I am to talk about it because I know that President Nelson is a prophet of God and the man is right on the money. He is spot on. So there may be people who want to correct him, but boy, 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 would I ever, oh, the idea of correcting a prophet of God who teaches the doctrine of Jesus Christ and thinking that we know better than he does makes me just cringe. I mean, it makes me so concerned. That's what, that is exactly what, that's exactly what Jacob is prophesying here. It is that people are looking beyond the mark and seeing this and that it's a it's a huge concern in our day and age that some people and, and I want to be careful. I hope I don't do this, 
But if we ever think that we are smarter than the prophet or the church should, should agree with us or somebody else over the prophet, we are in very, very shaky, deep, yucky water in my personal opinion. Anyway, you know, that was strong. I know that was strong. But. No, but you know what? He says that in this talk. He just yeah. says, you know, we can't, we can't, we can't get distracted and, and think that someone else has more knowledge or, or whatever. So we can't get distracted. And pretty much that's what Jacob says too, you know, in, uh, in, in chapter 11 of, of, of second Nephi. Um, I love that Elder Renlund goes on to talk about covenants, baptismal covenant and temple covenants and our, our, our having temples so close to us. Don't, don't, take that all for granted you know this is big stuff and jacob also goes on in verse 5 of chapter 11 he says and also my soul delighteth in the covenants of the lord yes and and then elder Renla, let's just look at uh paragraph 14 he says when we have the holy ghost with us and he's talked about the baptismal covenant when we have the Holy Ghost with us, we will be inspired and guided to make and keep other covenants such as those we make in temples. Doing so deepens our relationship with God. Huge. Yep. So covenant making is wanting to have a closer, deeper relationship with our Savior and, and with God. He said, you may have noticed that many new temples have been announced in recent years, bringing temples ever closer to members. Paradoxically, as temples become more accessible, it may be easier for us to become more casual about temple attendance. When temples are distant, we plan our time and resources to travel to the temple to worship there. We prioritize these journeys. It's, it's that focus. Uh, again, and and he just goes on uh, saying, schedule a time. You know, th this this is what we're here. I mean, we're here to do this. This is why we have so many temples within our access. Don't don't let don't drive by temples and not and think you're too busy. Yeah, amen. Elena, you 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 brought up a couple of thoughts, and one is that talk that I was that I referred to before, it's, it's Elder, Bet, Elder Renlund's talk, Experiencing God Loves, um, BYU. I wanna share this story he shared because it really affected me a lot. Um, and I'm gonna share this story, but I'm gonna make one more, <laughs> one more comment based on what you're saying and some of the comments that I'm seeing from all of you. So thank you for your comments. I'm, I'm reading them and listening to Elaine. I may be a bad devil, <laughs> whatever that word is. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> um, well, let me, I'll, I'll read this and I'll go I'll go well no I'm gonna say this one of the reasons Elaine and I are so determined and are doing this Instagram live is because we know there is a lot of confusion out in the world and we know that if we are not sincerely grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ and understand his doctrine and the purity we could be confused even within our own church the prophet is the one who speaks and teaches doctrine. The first presidency and quorum of the 12 have those keys. There are other people, even with the best of intentions, who may be confused or may be trying to teach something that is not necessarily accurate. Stick to the words of the prophets as much as you possibly can and understand the doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ and its purity. I, I cannot say that loud enough. I, I, I I have many wonderful friends and family members, including myself, who are trying to do what is right. But even me, I tell my students every single time I teach, every semester, please make sure that you understand that the spirit will confirm truth to you and stay close to the prophets. And if I ever say something that is not doctrinally sound, I would appreciate if you would correct me. And I am sincerely saying that to people. Sometimes we think, if we ever think intentionally that we are doing it, we have a serious, serious problem. But I love that President Eyring speaks simply because he's trying to teach the truth. And I love that Elder Redland is doing the same thing. These are men of God who have keys. And one of the responsibilities of their keys is to teach and clarify pure doctrine. No one else on the earth besides the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve has those keys. And that is a critical thing that we understand. So now I'm going on to number two because I, apparently I am on a soapbox right now, Elaine. <laughs> so here's, Good. here's my number two. I'm being focused. This is what he shares at BYU as a cautionary tale. So this is in terms of losing our focus, like Elaine is saying, and some things become so easy. He says this, 
in my experience, and this is Elder Redland's terminology, receptor dysfunction for God's love. <laughs> Receptor dysfunction. I mean, I don't need, you'll have to go back and read the talk to understand what that is. Receptor dysfunction for God's love happens slowly and imperceptibly over time, not all at once. Now listen to this great story. I will relate an embarrassing experience that I did not tell my wife for years, he says. I learned from myself that I was vulnerable. Because I suspect you might be at risk too, I will share my cautionary tale. It highlights this warning from the Savior. Elaine, are you okay if I keep going? Because I know I'm oh, blasting please, my mouth. Please okay. do. Okay. okay, here we go. He says, from the Savior, there's a possibility that man may fall from grace and depart from the living God. Therefore, let the church take heed and pray always, lest they fall into temptation. Yea, and even let those who are sanctified take heed also. And then he continues with his own story. He says, after I finished medical school, my wife, daughter, and I moved to Baltimore, Maryland for further training at Johns Hopkins Hospital. At that time, the training years were brutal, time intensive, and exhausting. Toward the end of my first year, I was weary because interns worked every day and every second or third night. I worked every Sunday and was able to attend church only about half the time. Our ward met in a suburb of Baltimore at 2.30 in the afternoon. We lived across the street from the hospital and had only one car. Some Sundays I could finish my work and join my wife and daughter as they left for the meeting at two o'clock PM. Other Sundays I could not. One Sunday I could tell that if I really hurried with my work, I would be able to go with my wife and daughter to church. But then I had this thought, if I slowed down a little bit and waited, I would not get home until after my wife and daughter had departed. Then I could skip church and take a nap. It <laughs> mortifies me, he says, to say that I did exactly that. I, mean, I just love this talk. I walked home at 2.15 and laid down on the couch, but I could not sleep. I was profoundly disturbed. I had always loved going to church. I had always felt a burning testimony of Christ's living reality, but on that day, the intensity was not there. I was not so hard to, it was not so hard to figure out why. I had stopped consistently doing some personal private acts of devotion. My routine was that I would get up in the morning, say a prayer and go to work. Sometimes there would be no distinction between the end of the day and the beginning of the next. I would work through the night and the next day, come home late that second day and fall asleep without a prayer and without reading anything in the scriptures. The following day, the cycle started again. I had allowed my receptors for God's love to become dull. So good so that the things of the spirit were less urgent and less important. With this realization, I got off the couch, knelt on the floor, and pleaded with God for forgiveness. I begged for help. As I did, a plan formulated in my mind and my heart, cha my heart to change the pattern of my behavior. I began with simple reminders for myself. On my daily to-do list, I started including morning and evening prayers. I brought a paperback book of, of the Book of Mormon to my cubicle in the hospital and included scripture reading on that to-do list. Some nights the scripture reading was short, just a few verses before midnight. Sometimes my prayers were offered in an unusual location, but I read the scriptures daily. I prayed daily. My plan included a commitment that I would never miss an opportunity to partake of the sacrament. Never. And then he finishes. As I enacted my new course of action, the intensity returned. My testimony burned brightly again. I shudder to think of what would have happened if I had not gotten off the couch on that Sunday afternoon. My life would have been very different. Instead, Heavenly Father and Jesus became central to my life again. My receptor for God's love and my affinity for the Spirit improved. Elaine, I, I love this story because I think we can all see ourselves in some form in this. I love what you're saying with the temple that you just mentioned, and I'm gonna turn this over to you. With the temple so close and the flexibility so common, we can just, our, our, our receptors for God's love and our receptors for the things of the Spirit may dwindle because it's so easy. And that's part of this is looking beyond the mark could be that it's so easy, we're not even focusing anymore. But it's such a reminder, we are not look, looking for excuses to not take the sacrament. We're looking for excuses to take the sacrament. We're not looking for excuses to not wear our garments. We're looking for excuses to wear our garments. We're not looking for excuses to stop reading our scriptures. We're trying to find excuses to read our scriptures. It's, it's the mindset. Do we want God's love? Do we want the spirit? Do we want his power? And often it's the small imperceptible things that make all the difference in the world. 
Anyway, oh, really like, I'm, I'm totally amen. with you. Amen. Barbara, thank you for sharing that because it, it's so pertinent to all of us today. And I know every one of you listening is going as hard and fast as you think you can. In fact, yesterday, I, I was just a little bugged because I just thought, where have the Sunday naps gone? <laughs> you know and, and i yeah. felt like my little granddaughter she came up to me one day i said let, let, let's go take a nap i was taking care of her and she said oh nana i've weaned myself from my naps and i <laughs> i think sometimes we have to wean ourselves from our naps uh and and i oh, he says he'd shudder to think where he'd be if he hadn't gotten off the couch that day and it is those just teeny tiny little things you just get too busy or too tired to read your scriptures or whatever, thinking reading the scriptures is a chore, but you can just read two sentences, really. I mean, it's yeah. you can do that. Just open the book. But um, where would he be? I don't. I don't know. I think. I think he was all along since he was eight years old when he he wanted to be perfect, and he he thought that maybe the truck should have hit him so he could go to heaven and be perfect because it was the day he got baptized. I think he's all along been preparing, be, been prepared to, to do what he's doing now, to be who he is now. I think I've watched that preparation and, and it's wonderful. But he, he even goes on to say, you know, um, in, uh, he tells the story of Naaman. Yep. And Naaman, Naaman goes uh, to be healed. Uh, he sought a cure for his leprosy and he was indignant. So some of us can can get offended, we can get indignant and, and, and then miss the mark. Again, the mark. We can get angry about a policy and miss the mark of the doctrine of Jesus yeah. Christ or the That's... atonement or, you know, whatever. Um, but he says Naaman was indignant and then he said he was persuaded to follow Elisha the prophet's counsel rather than rely on his own preconceived notions of how the miracle should occur wow sometimes we have preconceived notions and if it doesn't fit what we think then we think things aren't right and sometimes the lord works just the opposite of how we think in fact most times i'm finding that's the case for me but then he goes on to say in paragraph 17 as a result naaman was healed uh, he, because he listened to who to whom did he listen? This is huge for us as women and young women too. He listened to a woman, a young woman who had a testimony of Jesus Christ and of prophet, prophets. Yes. And she must have shown and glowed and had such a sweet, strong testimony that she changed the mind of a king. I love that. I love that. Uh, story. Amen, Elaine. And he, amen. But I love him because he he was he was a big he was big stuff, but he had the humility to say, well, okay, I'll I'll try this. Maybe maybe it'll work, and and it did. So anyway, that just even just that one paragraph is a whole sermon. Absolutely, where he says, when we trust God's prophet, this is still number seventeen. It's your paragraph. When we trust God's prophet on the earth today and act on his counsel we will find happiness and we can be and we too can be healed and then i just love this we need to look no further there there are so many so many people in so many ways that are trying to cause us happiness and you know president nelson talked about this in his in his think celestial talk that we can turn to so many other things but it's christ that we need to be turning to but there are a variety of other things that we can turn to instead and, and he lists those in his talk which i i just love that he was simple and plain with us I, I, um, I love his, again, this doctrinal teaching that he gives in this talk where he says, it is not the water and the bread that saves us, but it's Jesus Christ that saves us. I just think you, you nailed it again. He just, he just, he says these things and, and, and it's not their covenants that save us. It's Jesus Christ that saves us. But as we make and keep sacred covenants, we're putting ourselves in that position where he can save us. It's, He's, the focus is Jesus Christ and making sure we understand exactly what we're doing. So he's, in, number four, in number 11, he says, In the years since my baptism, I have learned that sins are cleansed by the power of Jesus Christ through his atoning sacrifice as we make and keep the baptismal covenant. Then through the gift of repentance, we can remain clean. I've also learned the sacrifice. 
sacrament brings a powerful virtuous cycle into our lives, enabling us to retain a remission of our sins. So this idea that you're talking about, it's getting that broken heart and that contrite spirit and being humble before the Lord so he can save us. We go to the prophet and like this young woman, hopefully as women and men, we are guiding people to the prophet and the prophet is guiding us to the savior and we are guiding people to the savior so that he can heal us. But we're not diverting people into other directions. You know, I mean, the wisdom behind this talk and how it applies to us today is so critical. Elaine, I'm going to go to 14 if that's okay. Are you okay if I jump into paragraph 14? Please do. He says, when we have the Holy Ghost with us, we will be inspired and guided to make and keep other covenants, such as those we make in the temple. And then I just love this. Doing so deepens our relationship with God. And then he talks about where you already went before. But I love, so number 15, there's a footnote there, number 15. And that just ties us to 3 Nephi chapter 18, verses 12 through 13 which I'm not going to go into right now, but also right before this, the footnote takes us to Elder Talmadge's book on the Articles of Faith, where he teaches the sanctifying effect of the Holy Ghost can cleanse all who repent with a sincere heart and with real intent. And I, I love that he is focusing on the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost and Jesus Christ, which Elaine, I think that's part of what you were saying is the Godhead. The responsibility and role of, of, of the Holy Ghost is to cleanse and purify which sometimes when we teach about the doctrine of Christ, for example, we teach that we are born of water and of the spirit. The water cleanses and the spirit burns, but they're both, it's both the cleansing and we have to have that Holy Ghost and the reception of the Holy Ghost to burn symbolically the sins. And that's why it's, it's both. We have to have the Holy Ghost as part of that cleansing process. It's true. And you know, Barbara, I think sometimes we, we say, well, the Holy Ghost is our constant companion. He's our comforter. He, uh, he guides us. He warns us. He teaches us. But we forget that he purifies us, that, yes. that, that, that we have to, as you taught, as you just taught, we need to look for every opportunity to be able to partake of the sacrament, to repent, partake of the sacrament, and receive that renewal of the promise that we'll always have the spirit to be with us because we need to be pure enough. What does it say in the Book of Mormon? Um, uh, so we'll be purified even as we'll, when he appears, we'll know him because we will be pure even as he is pure. Yep, just beautiful. Amen. Possible. It's possible. It is possible. Everyone. It is. Elena, number 16, I love this too, with this exoticness he's talking about, and we were just talking about bringing people to Christ and to their prophets. He says, um, we do not need to labor unsuccessfully, as they did for a time to find our treasure, nor need we seek counsel from exotic sources, prizing the novelty of the source and thinking such counsel will be more enlightened than that which we can receive from a humble prophet of God. So again, there are lots of book, books published. There's so much information. There's social media galore, YouTube, Apple. I mean, you name it. There are so many exotic sources in our day. There's so much information out there. Uh, we, we are not looking for information. We are looking for truth. And we're looking for the truth that is going to guide us to become like Jesus Christ. We could waste away our, our days looking for exotic information and things that are titill titillating to our brains. We're not here to find titillating things for our brains. We're here to find God and the sources and of the truth. Barb, don't you find that when you listen to some, some things, I'm always asking myself, okay, that's great knowledge, but therefore what? Therefore what? Yeah. You know, the, there's a lot of wisdom, knowledge that's imparted to us, but we can't forget the simplicity of just the treasure we have in Jesus Christ and focusing on the mark. Yeah, yes. he's Amen. the mark. Amen. And if, and if there are things, that, I mean, he's just, he just says it here so well. Maybe I'll go to 18. Um, it's just so good. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to remember and always focus on Jesus Christ. I mean, it's your point, Elaine. It's, it's the mark. He says it. He is our Savior and Redeemer, the mark to whom we should look and our greatest treasure. As you come to him, you will be rewarded with strength to face life's challenges, courage to do what is right, and the ability to fulfill your mission in mortality. I mean, is there anything more than we want? That's, that's the thing is, yes, there is tons of information out there. And there are tons, of, there, there's so much information and so many interesting things in this world. 
but that is not why we're here on the earth. I, I mean, it's just, you could just see Satan just having a heyday with distraction today. It's just so, uh, so frustrating. Anyway, sorry, I, I, I am on a soapbox today. Okay. Um, <laughs> So he says, as you come to him, you will be rewarded with strength to face life's challenges, courage to do what is right, and the ability to, to fulfill your mission in mortality. Which, by the way, we only have so many things to focus. We, we need all the help we can get. So let's focus on what's going to help, help us. Anyway, treasure the opportunity. Now he's, gonna, now he's going to list these five things. So number one, treasure the opportunity to repent. That's a principle. Number two, the privilege of partaking of the sacrament. Treasure that opportunity to partake of the sacrament. So this is, if we wanna, if we wanna stay within the focus of Christ, repent, take every opportunity we can to partake of the sacrament. And then number three, the blessings of making and keeping, keeping temple covenants. And number four, the delight of worshiping in the temple, which I think it's fascinating that he separates those two. And then number five, enjoy and, and the joy of having, having a living prophet. Elaine, I, I know I've already blasted my mouth on this, and I, I love talking about Temple Covenants and sacrament, everything else, but today, the, the, the gratitude I feel for having a living prophet, I, 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 I cannot express it enough. I, I, I don't know how the rest of the world lives without a living prophet. There is so much confusion in the world. There are so many voices out there, even in my own just 24 hours a day. I can get so easy easily sidetracked and so confused by what is happening in the world, even among those who are trying to get it right. But I cannot express enough gratitude that I have for President Nelson, President Oaks, President Eyring, and we could just go down the list from there and we could just all the way down to Elder Kieran. I, I cannot express my gratitude for these men who literally have given their lives, traveled the world, spent everything that they possibly could in the work of the Savior who are completely focused on the mark. I, I, I will follow as closely as I can to those men as I can. I mean, I, as I said in a devotional, I want to be right on their heels. Oh, yeah. Anyway, you know, yeah. go ahead. Well, you, you take you, it. You, you, you made me cry because uh, I feel the same way. Um, there's nobody I would rather be in a room with. There's nobody I would rather be around there's nobody that i would rather learn from than these prophets seers and revelators i'm so excited for general conference already i'm excited <laughs> and uh and i'm so grateful that we've been able to study these conference talks i would just say to everyone you know he's another elder renland is another one that you want to read all his footnotes yes because you can learn so much and the uh the part about what we think the water cleanses this but it's jesus christ and and he refers you to talmage take advantage of the yes. knowledge that this man has to to give us sources of of eternal truth it's eternal truth and i i'm like you barb i can't stress strongly enough that we are so blessed to have everything we have. And I think in the pre-mortal world, we said, I'll go down at the time when the turmoil of the world is the greatest because I'll have tools that will give me power that nobody even comprehends. I'll, I'll have the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'll have the gift of repentance. I'll have the gift of agency. I'll have the Book of Mormon, my guidebook. I'll have prophets, seers, and revelators to follow. Easy peasy. I can do that. You know, yeah. I think we thought that. And, and, and really, I think it, it, it's hard. We have challenges. We have trials. But we just have to keep that focus that this is, we're here to draw closer to the Savior and allow our choices to help us to do that. Let me just say, in, in our reading, uh, this second Nephi 11 through, uh, there's yep. a part in there I'm, I'm really, I really don't like to read, uh, and it starts. <laughs> it start, I'll just tell you, it's in chapter 13, a lot of it, and it goes on from there, but I'm afraid he's talking about us. And, and so, I, I don't know, maybe you can shed some light on that, Barb, but I don't, I just, I always think, ooh, I don't want to read that part because, He's talking about the latter days, isn't he? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, these it, all these chapters, all these chapters of Second Nephi, Isaiah is taking us to a variety of places. 
but definitely there's no question you can look at this and, and say this he's speaking of the latter days he may be speaking when, of other times as well but he's definitely speaking of the latter days when he says daughter the daughters of zion is he referring to us i i think us and other daughters of zion i don't know if yeah. it's just our time period but yes those who are covenant members of the church of jesus christ those are the covenant daughters of zion for sure okay well you can read it if you want but i like to skip that part no, <laughs> no i'm just kidding well, I'm it's just a good kidding, morning it's, elaine it's you know we, we could we, we could fall in these places you know ever learning but never coming to a knowledge of the truth i could yep. say the eternal truths amen the doctrines so Elder, Elder Holland, Elaine, I, I don't have the quote right in front of me, but he actually has this quote where he says, I don't, it's not, a, this is me summarizing. He says, it's not a matter of just knowing truth. I want to know what God knows and I want to know what God cares about. And, and that's the reality. There, there's so much to learn. And yes, God knows. And we know from section 80, 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants of history and of sciences and all those things, all of those are important, but there are some things that we just simply don't need to waste our time on. Mortality is too short to go down that path. So, uh, Elaine, you you brought up um, since you're talking about these 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 sections I and mean, these chapters in the Book of Mormon, I have to go take us back to chapter 11, which I just I just love. I love Jacob, and you brought up you talked about how he sees his redeemer. I mean, the prophet saw the redeemer. I, I just and and Nephi saw the redeemer, and Isaiah saw the redeemer, and then verse four. I just he says, behold. My soul delighteth in proving unto my people the truth of the coming of Christ. And then in verse five, my soul delighteth in the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made to our fathers. Yea, my soul delighteth in his grace and his justice and power and mercy in the great and eternal plan of deliverance from death. My soul delighteth, this is verse six, in proving unto my people that save Christ should come, all men must perish. So if there be no Christ, if there be no God, if there be no God, we are not. For if there could have been no creation, but there is a God. I mean, he knows. He saw him. There is a God. He is Christ. He cometh in the fullness of his own time. And then, and now I write some of the words of Isaiah. Why? Because Isaiah testified of Christ too. That whoso of my people shall see these words may lift up their hearts and rejoice for all men. Now these are the words and ye may liken them unto you and unto all men. I, when I read this, these scriptures here, you just feel this excitement from Jacob as he's just trying so hard to help people focus on the Savior and help people focus on him as a prophet. But I, I, I'm going to finish this with me, Elaine, if it's okay, because my, I, I mean, I sound so cheesy to say this, but I cannot help myself. My soul delights in the same things. I love proving to people, although I, I love, I love allowing the Spirit to prove to people that Jesus is the Christ. I love testifying of the covenants of God, and I delight in His grace and His justice and His power and His mercy. I love testifying that save Christ would come, we would all perish. I, mean, I just, it's so true. It makes me happy to just be able to testify of those things. So I'm going to finish in a footnote today in this talk. Elder, Elder Renlund and Elaine, if you want to, number 19, he talks about the Savior being his, his friend. I'll just read it, and then since I've already started. He says in number 19, I bear my solemn and sure witness that God, the Eternal Father, is our Heavenly Father, and that He lives. Jesus is the Christ. He is our kind, wise, heavenly friend. And this is his restored church and then i love just going to this footnote it's actually footnote number 17 but it ties in so well there he says president russell m nelson has said god has a special love for each person who makes covenants with him in the waters of baptism and that divine love deepens as additional covenants are made and faithfully kept it, true, true doctrine he just said there then he continues the multiple covenants on the covenant path are not just sequential but additive and even synergistic. Syner sorry, synergistic. They facilitate a closer and stronger connection with God. Such a connection allows us to be transformed to the point that His image is in our countenances and our hearts have been mightily and permanently changed. I, I just simply testify that as we really do follow the example of Jesus Christ, that we make and keep sacred covenants with Him and we continue to add upon these covenants the blessings of these covenants that we are making because of the atonement of Jesus Christ and his power become synergistic in our lives. 
we are building upon and receiving more and able to understand and feel God's love at a level we could not otherwise have. And the more we make and keep the covenants, the more we are able to receive God's power and are able to receive his love and that we are able to use his power in the way that he would want us to use it, which is to bring to pass the immortality, eternal life of God's children, or in other words, to save the souls of each other. So I, I just simply testify that as we draw closer to Christ and we follow his prophets and we stay focused on the mark, Jesus Christ, that we will be better instruments in God's hands and that we will have joy in this life and eternal joy in the world to come. And I say that, Elaine, with all of the love for, for, for these wonderful prophets and all the love for you and all of the love for all of you and all of us that are participating today. I really say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, amen, Barb. I love your excitement. We live in exciting times. We really do. We do. And we have every reason to be happy. And as President Nelson said, it's not the circumstances of our lives, but it's the focus. Again, oh, there's that word focus again. Yep. It's the focus of our lives that counts. And, and so I just say amen to everything you've testified of. I have felt the spirit so strongly this morning. And I'm so happy that I, be, I get to begin my week with the idea of, of, of focusing on our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's Monday. We just partook of the sacrament again yesterday. So um, let's all just try to be like him. And I would suggest two things. I would, well, I'm only going to suggest one thing. Just open your hymn book sometime when you have a minute or just put it on your, on your iPod and listen to the words of, I know that my Redeemer lives. And, and, and let's just have that little hymn maybe be a reminder to all of us this week that he does live. He loves us. He wants us safely home. He's given us everything we need. And I am so grateful for that. I'm grateful for our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that God loved us enough that he would give us his son to ensure our return. So I, 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 I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and I'm just so grateful today, uh, to, to even though I'm tired from Sunday, to go forward in this week. And I, I just pray that all of us will keep focused, not miss the mark, because Jesus Christ is our treasure, as Elder Renlund said. And I can tell you, I can testify too, Elder Renlund is a prophet of God. I've watched him be prepared. So that's, that's enough stuff, but we love you all. And we're so happy we get to do this with all of you. So thank you for tuning in. And I was saying, thank you for walking with us. We, we do invite you to invite other people to walk with you, walk with us. We have this here Monday morning live, but you can also, we try to put it on YouTube. We're learning all the system, but we would just love to continue to walk with you in this process. But please, please share it with other people so we can continue to be a light and help other people. We can be a light in the Savior's hands. We're going to walk with you, but we're definitely going to walk yep. with him. Love you all. Love you guys. Bye -bye. Thank you. Love you, Elaine. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.